Welcome back to the Hardware Unbox News Corner. Today's episode is going to be a bit different to some of our past News Corner episodes in that at least the first half is going to go through some odds and ends from our suite of Ryzen and Navi reviews over the last week. There hasn't been too many news stories to emerge this week with all this you know, review action. Uh, we'll cover the big ones later, but at least for now, let's talk about some review-related stuff. So let's start with one of the bigger issues, I'd guess you have to say, from the reviews this week, and that's the whole BIOS slash motherboard clock speed and boost situation issue. I guess this started after Anantec discovered their MSI motherboard wasn't boosting AMD's third gen Ryzen parts correctly, and went on a mission to update every result to account for improvements to lightly threaded tasks. So for starters, Steve used an MSI X570 creation motherboard for his testing and spotted no issues with boost behavior or performance, so as far as we can tell, our results are representative of the true performance of these CPUs. Our 3900X, for example, did clock up to 4.6 GHz with a single thread loaded as expected. Gamers Nexus also did an investigation with their Gigabyte board comparing the performance of various BIOS and AGISA revisions and found very small performance gains in some situations compared to the early BIOS versions. But overall, the findings weren't significant enough to change the overall margins or thoughts all that much. It was only those like Anantec that were having issues that were pretty significant and required a large overhaul of their results. It does seem like every release we see these sorts of reports come out about how people have tested stuff wrong and there's always 10% more performance left to be waiting to be unlocked, I guess you have to say, uh, with the right configuration. Um, but this really pans out. It just seems like a few people having typical early teething issues with their motherboards. We didn't have any such issues. And yeah, we expect that our results will be representative of what you guys will get if you do end up buying these processes. With that said, overall, we have done some additional testing with other motherboards and have found that Gigabyte's X570 boards seem to provide the best performance in lightly threaded gaming workloads. Didn't really affect our day one review, but for some of the other games Steve is testing for the 30 game benchmark video that's coming soon, he noticed small gains with Gigabyte, similar to what Gamers Nexus saw when he tested the latest BIOS versions. Steve will have more to say on that in the 30 game benchmark video, which will be comparing the 3900X to the 9900K stock and overclocked in many more titles than we covered in the first video. That big benchmark will be going live next week, so stay tuned for that arriving on the channel. The one thing that was impacted from our day one coverage was our World War Z results. We noticed in that game that all Ryzen CPUs performed around the same and well behind Intel, which we thought was odd, but as with all these launches, you can get some interesting numbers. Then a few days later, we received a patch for World War Z and spotted a huge performance uplift for Ryzen, which Steve mentioned briefly a few videos ago. Well, we reached out to AMD and they confirmed that a patch did get released for World War Z that improved Ryzen's performance significantly. The patch actually launched before we did our testing, but the Epic Games Store didn't deliver it to us until just a few days ago. The update brings Ryzen much closer to Intel when CPU Limited. We'll be using those updated results for our ongoing testing, like a review of the 3800X that we want to get to, as well as, of course, the big game benchmarks. The other stuff I wanted to touch on briefly relates to Radeon image sharpening. That video that went live yesterday did better than we expected and got quite a few comments, so there's a few things that I just wanted to quickly cover. Obviously the main focus of the video was resolution downsampling and comparing Radeon image sharpening versus DLSS for this task. That's mostly because both AMD and Nvidia have been talking about these respective features for improving performance at high resolutions. A lot of you guys have been asking about how Radeon image sharpening fares against other sharpening tools, including reshade and sweet effects, along with Nvidia's own tool found within Freestyle. Since there's been a lot of interest in that, I will cover that in a follow-up video, so stay tuned. One thing I will say though, is we aren't going to use Radeon image sharpening for our performance testing in the future. Some people have been saying to compare the RX 5700 XT with image sharpening at 4K to Nvidia cards at native resolutions. Uh, pretty much not gonna happen. The reason is you can use downsampling plus sharpening with any GPU. You just need a tool like Reshade. It might not be as good, but it should get close. I will explore that further. AMD just provides the easiest solution yet with Radeon Image Sharpening and are the first company to talk about using sharpening in this way with their GPUs. Anyway, I've got enough extra thoughts on this to fill an entire new video, so stay tuned for that. Initial impressions though are that it's the best and easiest solution to harness the power of resolution downsampling while not being totally unique or original. More to come though. Okay, now into some news topics for the week. Haven't been too many of note with the mega week of AMD benchmarks and so on, but I'll just run through the exciting ones here. To start with video cards and hardware 
Hardware Lux have revealed that MSI will be launching seven custom Radeon RX 5700 series graphics cards. While this information did leak from them, we've basically confirmed that everything is legit and it sounds like MSI isn't too concerned about this information floating around before launch. So the seven cards in question are split between four 5700 XT models and three for the 5700. Both GPUs are getting Air Boost, Mech OC, and Gaming X models, and there is an image showing off what the Mech OC will look like. If you couldn't guess, it's like many of MSI's custom GPU designs over the past few years, especially for AMD GPUs. The 5700 XT is also getting an Evoke OC model. Unfortunately, you don't have much other information to go on aside from these model names. These cards are set to bring quite a substantial improvement over the AMD reference cooler for Navi. We've seen lots of complaints about the blower fan running hot and loud, so I think these beefier designs will go a long way to alleviating the issues there. And it seems with MSI offering Gaming X models, which are typically reasonably high end coolers, AIBs aren't going to sit around and only offer a few Navi options. It'll also be interesting to see how far AIBs will push factory overclocks, given it seems the 5700 XT in particular has quite a bit of headroom. MSI will be bringing their AIB cards to the market in August. It seems like this is the default time for basically all AIBs. Perhaps some will leave it to September, but it shouldn't be too far away. We'd probably advise those interested in Navi to hold off for the AIB models, especially if they come in at the same price or close to AMD's reference cards. And of course, there should be models from all sorts of vendors. If you're after a more extreme cooling solution for your Navi GPU, EK Waterblocks has a new full coverage GPU block for AMD's Radeon RX 5700 series. The unit is compatible with both reference GPUs, and the cold plate covers all of the GPU, GDDR6 memory, and VRM. We're getting EK's usual open split flow micro channels and sealing through high quality EPDM O rings. As for materials, the base is made of copper or nickel plated copper, while the top is available in acrylic or black acetyl. If you go for the acrylic option, the block itself is illuminated with RGB, while the acetyl option gets an RGB white corner element. You can also add on a back plate if you would like. These Navi blocks will begin shipping on July 26 with pricing around 125 to 130 euros depending on the model. Throw in an extra 27 to 34 euros for the back plate, so certainly quite expensive relative to the price of the GPU, but as an enthusiast product that's always what comes with the territory. And I believe Steve is getting these to review or at least test out, so yeah, I guess we'll have some more Navi related testing on the channel shortly with these water blocks. For a brief period, Intel's Core i9-9900KF got a price cut. As spotted by TechSpot and PC Gamer a few days ago, the i9-9900KF was listed at just $440 US on Amazon, which is around $40 to $50 less than the usual asking price for the CPU and quite a decent deal considering the high price Intel's 8-core has usually occupied. Unfortunately, the deal was extremely short-lived. As of right now, the 9900KF is back up to a standard $480, so the discount wasn't permanent. In fact, it didn't even last for a couple of days. There have been some rumors that Intel would soon discount the prices of their 9th gen core processors in response to AMD's aggressive Ryzen 3000 series products and pricing, but so far that hasn't eventuated. Maybe we'll get that soon. Final topic I just want to cover is the state of MSI's motherboards with Ryzen 3000 series CPUs. We've been getting a number of tweets and comments at us about people having issues with MSI 400 series motherboards, in particular B450 boards, with AMD's new CPUs. So I just wanted to chat a little bit about that here. Firstly, we haven't seen any issues with B450 boards ourselves with third gen Ryzen chips, including the Tomahawk that we've loved to recommend a fair bit. We're not 100% sure what the issues could be, but hopefully they will be resolved soon through BIOS updates. We do know that a lot of OEMs like MSI didn't receive CPUs like the 3700X and 3900X before they went on sale to the public, so it seems a lot of testing has been done with other samples and might have contributed to some of these problems. Not 100% sure whether that's been the cause, but we did hear that, again, yeah, some of those CPUs that you guys are now buying weren't actually available to OEM to test with until the final release. The other problem MSI and other board vendors have is small BIOS chip sizes. Many older motherboards have just a 128 megabit, aka 16 megabyte, flash chip for storing the BIOS, but every time AMD pushes out a new Agisa microcode update, the size of it grows substantially to accommodate all the new CPUs. This is putting limits on boards that were built using 128 megabit chips rather than the larger 256 megabit options. Uh, some board vendors have resorted to releasing light versions of their BIOS with compatibility for older chips stripped out and often with simplified interfaces. 
MSI seem to be doing something unusual and releasing revised 400 series boards with larger BIOS chips. They're calling these boards the Max series with everything from the X470 Gaming Plus to the B450 Tomahawk to even the A320 MA Pro getting a Max version. This updates the board with a 32 megabyte BIOS chip and allows full compatibility with AMD's AM4 lineup without needing to cut down on the BIOS interface or features. They should also ship with out of the box support for third gen Ryzen. The reason this is important is that 400 series boards will remain popular for quite some time, especially with X570 boards often costing at least $200. For budget builders, a B450 motherboard is the best choice, and MSI wants to continue offering the best B450 boards on the market, hence the minor revision. That's it for this week's News Corner. Subscribe to get the segment in your inbox every week. Consider supporting us on Patreon. It's been a big week. I'll catch you in the next one.